It's now my great uh, honor and pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's uh, guest speaker for the Young Leaders Conference 2021, General James Mattis. Uh, General Mattis, uh, great honor having you tonight here as our guest speaker. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. It's really a, a great honor for us. Uh, we met back in 2019 when I had the honor of uh, visiting you in Washington, D.C., together with our chairman, Sigma Gabriel. And at that point, you kindly offered to also talk to our young crowd, our young leaders of Atlantic Brooke. As you know, this is a program uh, which already runs, runs since the 1970s. It's uh, very close to our heart. It's actually part of the DNA of our institution, Atlantic Brooke. Uh, we work on transatlantic relations. And in this week here at the Schlossner Hardenberg in Brandenburg, Germany, we talk about a wide range of transatlantic issues and this really for us is, of course, the pinnacle of our program, having you as our guest speaker. And uh, again, I would like to thank you on behalf of our institution and the entire group for taking the time. Um, and now you will be introduced in more detail uh, by Lieutenant Commander Christopher Familetti, who will also moderate the discussion. Again, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As mentioned, my name is Chris Familetti. I'm an officer in the U.S. Navy, uh, where I serve as a Growler Electronic Warfare Officer and Tactics Instructor. It is my distinct honor and privilege to both introduce and moderate the discussion this evening with General Jim Mattis, United States Marine Corps retired. General Mattis is a native of Richland, Washington and served for 43 years in the United States Marine Corps. He led Marines into combat in Iraq in 1991, into Afghanistan following the September 11th terrorist attacks, and again during the subsequent conflict in Iraq. He also served in the staffs of two secretaries of defense as the commander of the United States Joint Forces Command and the NATO Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation. General Mattis's Marine Corps career culminated with him serving as the commander of the United States Central Command, responsible for the military operations of over 200,000 military personnel. Following his Marine Corps service, General Mattis culminated his service to the United States by serving as the 26th Secretary of Defense. General Mattis currently is the Davies Family Distinguished Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and also serves on the board of the directors of General Dynamics. He's the author of two books, correction, he's the author of one book and the editor of another, the New York Times bestseller, Call Sign Chaos, Learning to Lead, and the co-editor of Warriors and Citizens, Americans' Views of Our Military, a collection of writings on the state of civil and military relations in the United States. Sir, thank you again for taking the time to speak with us today. We look forward to the chance to discuss some of the key issues that we've been tackling over the course of this week. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, David. And thank all of you uh, for inviting me to engage with you. Uh, the older I get, the more impressed I am by how young my teachers are. And I see this very much as a bridge, as a two-way street where we're going to engage here today. Um, you get to my age and you either made it or not made it or whatever, and you want to pass on lessons learned. Uh, the idea being that we, we tell you what we learned, in some cases the hard way, uh, and share it openly with you so that you young uh, women and men, you go out and uh, you make your own mistakes, not the same ones that some of us made. So... Uh, I think what I want to do is talk for just a few minutes to kind of prime the pump, close a little bit of the distance between an old uh, former Marine infantry guy uh, and you young folks. Um, at the same time, uh, maybe give you some, some ideas uh, that we can discuss or in the best part, uh, maybe even challenge me on in the Q&A. Uh, I want to make a couple points up front because I, am, I consider myself historically grounded. I oftentimes turn to history, my fine young leaders, because it tells me how other men and women in the past dealt with similar issues, either successfully or unsuccessfully. And because of that, I actually come to you with a, with a sense of optimism about the German-American relationship. I believe it is strong. I believe it is a strong, has a strong future. Uh, it heavily rides on young people like you who are willing to look sometimes beyond hot political rhetoric or divisive issues to see the more fundamental rhythms uh, between these two democracies. Um, I think, too, that the relationship that we have has transcended problems. It's transcended changes in administration, changes in chancellors and presidents. It's, uh, it's chained and dare I say, uh, 
various ambassadors. Uh, it has been a tested relationship and we've always found ways to work things out. Uh, sometimes surprisingly so, especially to our adversaries, our, our political adversaries. But a point that recently that we must discuss, I think, and, and be aware of is democracy has perhaps proven a bit more fragile than many of us assumed having grown up in them since, our, since the day we were born or immigrated into these uh, democracies as my mother did. Um, we need young leaders today who can breathe new life into democracy's promise that make more people feel that they're part of this, that some of the tribalism and some of the elbowing aside that has been uh, more recently uh, in vogue, uh, that we can overcome it. So I come to you uh, with a sense of, of devotion to each one of you. I don't know you personally. But just the fact that you are here, that you're taking time, and I've gone over your, your backgrounds, what little I have here and where you're at, what firms you're in, your positions, just the fact that you're taking time to think about how do we deal with each other in this world? How do we deal with others? How do we put others first has got to be somewhere in your DNA. And I admire that and I salute it. Uh, it's also important to remember that each country has its own culture. Uh, America was founded by people who created a government that embodies distrust in government, distrust in government. And after our very nasty argument with King George III, uh, we were compelled to put together a government that would not rule us. Um, and it's also a power that has proven repeatedly to be reluctant to engage with the world. It's a big, big country. It's a big population. It's a diverse population. And there's oftentimes a, an insular sense in America that will surface repeatedly in our history. Uh, following World War I, you saw where the Americans proposed, the American president proposed strongly for a League of Nations and then promptly declined to join once it was founded. Um, the point I would make is, uh, and here is where I'm a bridge for you, I was raised by the, what we call the greatest generation in America. And that generation uh, following World War II, um, they, they saw a country that did not need to be perfect to be worth fighting for. It had to be always improving, but it did not need to be fight, uh, perfect. They had been through a global economic depression and a world war that was, that the horrible aspect of it cannot be fully articulated by any of us today, the amount of heartbreak and disaster uh, and this greatest generation came home from the war and said, it's a crummy world. And yet people who had been isolation, strongly isolationist in the 1930s said, whether you like it or not, we're part of it. And that was a reality that the depression and war had brought home to them. Um, and they, with the American led effort in the aftermath and you see it manifested in the UN, which was never designed to be perfect and solve all the world's problems. It was designed to solve as many as possible diplomatically in a place where people, all the nations could gather. Uh, Bretton Woods, you and I know its aftermath, as, uh, its outcomes as the IMF, as the World Bank. People without hope did not have to turn to a fascist or a communist or an ideologue to regain hope. There were lenders of last resort that would help people create wealth and create prosperity that gave hope to people. They didn't have to elect a fascist to make the trains run on time. Uh, and it took a foreign ambassador to teach this to me. I was having lunch with an ambassador in Washington when I was a NATO Supreme Commander. And this ambassador said, that after World War II, following World War II, the Americans made the single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history. Well, I thought I knew something about American history. 
being an American and him being a foreign. I said, oh, you must mean the Marshall Plan. And he was dismissive. He said, no, no. He said, the Marshall Plan. He said, that, that just showed America was a different kind of victor, more generous, uh, uh, you know, a young graduate student knocking on former President Truman's door, Dr. then Henry Kissinger, asked the former president what he was proudest of, of the greatest generation. He said that we beat fascism and welcomed the German, the Italian, the Japanese people back into the community of nations with the Marshall Plan and, and things like that. Um, he said, no, no, the ambassador said, that, that was not, not the greatest pledge. He said, he said, after World War II, the Americans could have retreated again and said, look, that's twice in 25 years we got dragged into these wars and lost hundreds of thousands of our lads. We're going to Asia, Africa, Latin America for our markets, Western Europe, democracies, you're on your own with the Soviet Union. And he said, instead, you pledged 100 million dead Americans when you formed NATO alongside European democracies. Uh, and you pledged them in defense of democracy. It took a foreigner to teach me that, my fine young Germans and Americans. It took a foreigner to open my eyes to understand uh, how democracies work together. And in my 40 some years, 45 years of government service, uh, I've learned that America is always at its best when it listens, when it's a team player, and when it leads, I might add. Uh, think of 1990 when Kuwait was invaded and occupied and the Americans led the liberation of Kuwait, but there were dozens and dozens of nations who contributed to that. Think of 1997 in Bosnia and, and Kosovo and stopping the killing there as NATO uh, goes in and the Americans lead. Think of the response to 9-11 when over 3, 000, almost 3,000 citizens, innocent citizens of 91 countries are murdered in New York City and Washington and the effort to go back at it or in 2007, 2008, the global financial crisis, uh, and we worked together to avert uh, a looming uh, worldwide depression. Uh, of the AIDS crisis in Africa, when President Bush uh, can, leads the effort to stop that epidemic in its tracks, or, or the Ebola River uh, epidemic, uh, under President Obama, and then along comes COVID, and we see the Americans at home and abroad, not only not leading, but but recoiling <clears throat> and not doing uh, what it has done in these other crises of our era. And I think that there was this idea that if we step back, others step forward, and yet that didn't prove to be the case as nations went nationalistic. And only now with the Biden administration are we putting out over a hundred million doses already and more, more to follow on, on the COVID relief for the countries that don't have it. Um, and I think that uh, if the Americans don't lead, not much seems to happen. Uh, we face a situation today, the democracies do, in what I would call almost a strategy-free mode, and we've been that way for a while. And I point the finger at Washington, but also at other capitals where the values are being doubted, the values of democracy are being doubted by some people. Um, I think that if a responsibility of any leader in any firm, in any government, in any military, in any university, is to define reality. I, I see our, our leadership in many cases needing young, vigorous leaders who are willing to confront reality and, and to lead once again, to make sure that in your leading, uh, you know, I used to study George Washington. How did he defeat the most uh, capable army with his revolutionary ragtag group alongside some French 
uh, the, the French uh, forces, but also Polish and German and French advisors. And he's a very boring leader, but he gives us an example, I think, for today. I told you I study history to understand today better. He is one of the most boring leaders you could ever study. But how did he beat the Redcoats who would humble Napoleon a few years later? And he would listen, and he would listen with a sense of curiosity, not of judgment. He would learn. And by listening and learning other points of view, he was showing respect. And then he would find a way to help, to help his soldiers, uh, to help his political rivals at times. And then, and only then, <clears throat> would he lead. And the reality is that today we face under Putin a Russia that is willing to muck around in other nations' elections to assassinate political rivals. We deal with a China that looks toward other nations as tribute nations that they must kowtow and, and do as the Chinese say. Australia has been told to collar their free press or face economic privation from China. Uh, playing by the rules of the greatest generations that people like Adenauer and Eisenhower and others put together benefits all nations, large and small, powerful and not powerful. And I think that this time uh, when the democracy seem to be expressing self-doubt, we need some of you young people to step forward with a strategy, uh, with a strategic approach. Strategy is also an appetite suppressant, suppressing. Uh, ideas of adventures abroad where you are not thoughtful in what you're doing to help create a more prosperous, a more peaceful world. And we need to return to that sort of strategic approach because the problems we face today, whether it be COVID or climate change or Russia or China violating uh, international norms, these are not problems that can be solved by any one nation. When I was commanding over a quarter million uh, US and allied troops, I used to remind my American officers, not all the good ideas come from the country with most aircraft carriers. And so as we look at how we engage with the world, I'm actually encouraged by the Biden's administration's work with the Quad, Japan, India, Australia, by his approach to the, uh, to the uh, EU and to NATO. And I think there are examples there of how democracies work together for the good of everyone, everyone on this planet. But anyway, I've thought many times, uh, I, as uh, Chris mentioned, <clears throat> and I would just tell you that, uh, if there is one solution to the problems we face in this world, especially solutions that don't require the force of arms, uh, that, that's uh, the, the one word I would give you is allies, allies, and allies.